And I think this is another uh, insight that well, has been missing generally, is that Bitcoin is software. It's mm -hmm. not a form of money. It's just software like any other software. And so you can write tools entirely in software to address these business needs and also the needs of the merchants. So we have a set of distributors and we're available basically all over the world now in 190 countries. This content is brought to you by Uphold, which is a great crypto platform that I've been using since 2018. Uphold has all the top cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and all the altcoins. In fact, they have 260 plus cryptocurrencies on their platform. You can also trade precious metals, stable coins, and 37 fiat currencies. In addition, they are available in over 150 countries. And this platform is fully reserved. They do audits. So you can trust that your funds are safe. No commingling, no lending out your funds. If you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description. Welcome to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Akin Fernandez, who's the founder and CEO of Esteco. Akin, great to have you on. Thanks for having me. Akin, I'm excited to speak with you because you and the folks at Esteco are doing something really cool where you're helping to bring Bitcoin to billions of people around the world, many who don't have easy access to crypto exchanges and things along those lines. But before we get to that, uh, tell us about yourself, your background, um, your professional background as well. Well, I'm originally from uh, Brooklyn, New York, believe it or not. And my professional background is mostly in software and before that publishing. Mm -hmm. I used to run a very uh, infamous cult publishing company back in the uh, 1990s. And then I moved into software, which is my actually true passion. And then when Bitcoin came along, I you know, took my long-term interest in what money is and how it actually works, and then decided to dedicate my full uh, time and the rest of my career to Bitcoin. So that's the, 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 long, the, long, uh, the long version of that story. And do you remember what was your first encounter with Bitcoin? Did a friend tell you about it? Did you see that on a forum? And, uh, you know, sometimes people need to hear about it and see it a few times before it clicks for them and they have their aha moment. What, what was that journey like for you? Well, I read about Bitcoin from uh, a forum, actually. Somebody mentioned this new thing called Bitcoin, and I already had an interest in uh, synthetic money. And so when I read about this, uh, this, this so-called Bitcoin, I was skeptical, like most people are, but I had a different reason for being skeptical because the problem that uh, Bitcoin was claiming to solve was a very hard one in computer science. Mm -hmm. And so obviously I had to find out what this Bitcoin is all about. Uh, having had a background in uh, using BitTorrent and other types of, uh, well, other attempts to solve this problem, I knew that if this problem had actually been solved, the double spending problem, and also the problem of having a single centralized server, that mm. this could be something super important. So I immediately downloaded the Bitcoin client, which is a very familiar thing for anybody who uses BitTorrent and things like that. And I started to use Bitcoin, uh, what well, started to, to mine Bitcoin actually myself on a single machine. And it appeared to work exactly as described. And so I decided then, when I was already a software developer working on an SMS project, to stop working on that SMS project and start working on, on Bitcoin. And the first implementation I did with Bitcoin was to accept Bitcoin payments for SMS credits. Mm -hmm. Now, back then, this is around 2012, nobody was using Bitcoin like that for, for anything, but it was a proof of concept. It proved to me that I could actually use the Bitcoin server to write an application. And then it occurred to me that there's no easy way to get Bitcoin. Back then there was an exchange called InterSango and you had to send a bank transfer to Amir Taki who ran it. And then three days later, after you'd given him your Bitcoin address, you would receive Bitcoin in your wallet. Now three days for something like this is just absurd. And because of my background, I knew that there actually is a more easy way to do this transaction because Bitcoin, when you think about it as software and not as a kind of money, it's exactly the same as top-ups for SMS calls and GSM. 
And so by marrying these two, I, these two ideas together, I came up with the idea of Azteco where you can buy Bitcoin in the same way that you buy airtime basically uh, all over the world. Most people in the world don't have pay after, pay in arrears cellular telephone uh, accounts. We pay for this through your telephone service in advance through vouchers. This is true even in 2024 all over the world. So it's, it was an easy step for me having this uh, understanding and background to go from one thing to another and forming the idea of Azteco. Then it was just a problem of writing the software. Mm. So I have so many questions around that. And um, to your point, and I want to make sure the audience listening and, and viewing this, that they understand, you know, if they're in the United States, this is not necessarily an issue for them, but there are billions of people in other countries. It's not as easy to go log into a Coinbase or Kraken or whatever it is and, and be able to buy and access Bitcoin and even transact with it. Um, so your your service and solution is critical to help them get exposure to uh, the assets. So let's say I'm in, I don't know, some country in South America, right? and I want to access Bitcoin, walk us through, if you can, the step-by-step -step process, and maybe I just have a flip phone, right, to, to getting uh, access to Bitcoin. It's exactly the same as topping up your phone, your mm. flip phone, if you want to make calls to anybody on earth. You go to a point of sale, it could be a pharmacy or a news agent or whatever it is, or even a wooden shack at the side of the road as they have in the in places in the continent of Africa. And then you pay that person $10, $5, or whatever it is in the local currency, and then they give you a paper slip. And that paper slip looks exactly like this. It looks exactly like this piece of paper here with a QR code in it. And then you scan that QR code with your phone or put in the 16-digit code manually and then three seconds later, you get that Bitcoin topped up to your account in your in your Bitcoin wallet. And that can be Samurai Wallet or Wallet Satoshi or any Bitcoin wallet where you can be assigned an address that you can then put into a form. And that's it. It's as simple as that. There are no other steps and there don't need to be any other steps. The other steps that people have to go through to get Bitcoin in the first world are a product of the misunderstanding and the miscategorization of Bitcoin as money. As mm -hmm. soon as you don't think of it as money, but think of it as a kind of top up or phone credit, then you can build a service based only on that and remove all the complexity. And that's how you're going to reach billions of people. Billions of people are not going to log into Kraken, uh, a service that I love, by the way. All right. Akin or any of these other exchanges, even if they could, even if they could pass the identity uh, requirements, which m billions of people actually can't, those are only tools essentially for businesses and for traders. They're not for the, the common man who just wants to get something very, very simple done, like mm -hmm. sending money abroad or receiving money or, or that kind of thing. It's all very simple for most people. And so you wouldn't expect people to uh, build a phone charger for themselves if they want to charge their telephones. And that asking the ordinary consumer to go to an exchange to buy Bitcoin is a similar kind of thing. What we do is we bring con Bitcoin into the consumer fold. We're the consumer Bitcoin company. And that means we have to address people and serve them where they are and not pull them into where we think they should be. We have to think of them as the uh, the, the guiding, like the North Star, and make sure that we can serve them in a way that's very, very simple to understand. And we've actually proven it now because our, our service is hugely, wildly popular. Mm. Now, um, you mentioned the different wallets that, you know, it could be any uh, major Bitcoin wallet. Um, and Azteco, I'm assuming you're the one bridging the, the gap in the relationship with the pharmacy or the business, right, to set them up to be able to do this. Is that correct? That's right. We have a, a series of distributors that, we're, that allow us to sell our vouchers worldwide and mm -hmm. output them to a common point of sale system. So we don't have to actually write any software or do any uh, bespoke integrations in order for our vouchers to come out of those points of sale. Mm 
Mm. And I think this is another uh, insight that well, has been missing generally, is that Bitcoin is software. It's mm. not a form of money. It's just software like any other software. And so you can write tools entirely in software to address these business needs and also the needs of the merchants. So we have a set of distributors and we're available basically all over the world now in 190 countries through a different set of uh, uh, distributors. And so when somebody in Venezuela or something wants to sell one of our vouchers, they don't have to actually intera interact with us. They use their existing relationships with distributors who sell other top-up products to just mm -hmm. add as Teco as one of the top-up products that are available. Only in our case, the top-up product being delivered is Bitcoin. And Bitcoin has a global reach. It has global utility. And so it's not like a telephone top-up that only works inside one network. Bitcoin works in the entire world as if the entire world were the network. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love that uh, structure and concept of how it's, like you said, software, and you're integrating it into point of sale software and and the infrastructure that exists there. So it makes it easy. Like it, there's not too much heavy lifting there. Um, I am curious about, and you probably have this POV dealing with different uh, consumers globally. You know, those who are, let's say, in, in a country in Africa or South America, um, when they buy that Bitcoin, what what are they doing? Are they holding it? Are they viewing it as a uh, a reserve asset, you know, something to keep the store of value, or are they sending it to people or transacting? What is the use case you're seeing the most of? Well, this is a very interesting question, and we get it quite a lot. And I think the best way to think about it is to uh, think about what is the use case for money? Mm -hmm. There is no single answer for that. And Bitcoin, because it's a money simulation as well as being a communications network, uh, you can pay for anything or use it for any context and scenario where you're using money. And mm. because money is half of all transactions, it is uh, something that's universal. And so as Bitcoin grows, right now there's a, there are a lot of speculators in, in Bitcoin and it's being used for a small number in, compar in comparison to the number of uses that uh, fiat is used for, a small number of uses. But at its root, Bitcoin has the same utility as money. Now, for the people who are buying Azteco vouchers, they're buying it for every conceivable uh, purpose. What they're doing when they buy these vouchers is if you have a lot of money, you're, you, you're using it for the, the storage and, and speculation uh, utility. But as you go down in the size of the voucher, the lower you get, the more it's being used for spending. And as Azteca, we talk about the three use cases of Bitcoin, which is saving, spending, and sending. And so those are the, that's the blanket that we, uh, we use to describe how Azteca vouchers are, 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 are used. And I think it's very useful to boil it down to those things because actually that's what money is for, is for saving, spending, or sending. And as people, certainly in the so-called third world, start to understand how powerful Bitcoin is, the sending aspect for them is probably going to be the number one use case because uh, the, most people in the world don't have a lot of savings. Savings is a, is a fun game for the rich. And so money still has the same utility, but if you have a small amount of money, you have to live uh, day to day, you have to get things done. And so saving is something that you can do almost as a luxury. But Bitcoin is obviously good for that. And anybody who started saving Bitcoin five years ago, judging by today's prices, is a very happy person. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, can I, for example, if I have, a, I have a friend, and once again, in certain parts of the world, and, and uh, it's a developing country, and they're not able to get access to a crack in exchange and so forth, can I gift a voucher? Can I say, hey, I'm going to send you $100 or something, um, and so that they can then put it into their wallet. Or, you know, let's say they haven't fully set, set it up on uh, their wallet and so forth, but I'm going to get you the voucher and then you can then take care of the rest. Can I do that? Absolutely, 100%. Our vouchers 
uh, when they're out a piece of paper or if they're in the form of an image on the screen, work exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. And people do give up away as techo vouchers as gifts. And so that, that's absolutely perfectly possible and encouraged. Mm. Now, you guys had uh, got a found, uh, excuse me, a funding round, and I believe Jack Dorsey participated. Can you tell us about that funding round and and how are you working with Jack and so forth? Well, Jack's been actually very useful for us. He's um, was the lead in our seed round, where we raised six million dollars, and this has uh, allowed us to do a lot of the things that we've been dreaming of for many years. First of all, refining the user experience of our website, so now it's a world class very unique, uh, unique to Bitcoin user experience. And it's very important to have a user experience that differentiates Bitcoin from FinTech. Mm. FinTech has a graphic design language that's uh, instantly recognizable as FinTech. And I think that's a mistake if you're a Bitcoin company because we don't want to be categorized, certainly in Azteco's case, as another FinTech. We are a different kind of company. We're a Bitcoin company. It's much less a fintech than more like a telecoms company. So we need to uh, have a, an interface in the public facing uh, design that's not frightening, that's not fintechy, that doesn't um, drive ordinary people away with all kinds of symbols and languages that, and language that they don't understand. Mm -hmm. And so that investment that, that that round that we had uh, was been very very useful for us and also it's allowed us to take on some world-class um, employees for want of a better description including a, uh, a an 11 year apple uh, product uh, product manager he's not product manager. he's a uh, it, it escapes me now because i'm in the on an interview but it, this guy is from apple and he is absolutely wonderful and he's changed the way we do things internally so that all of our systems are more prepared for the deluge of uh, uh, users that have been coming. And so that's where that money is, is, is being used. And uh, it, we're very, very grateful to Jack for having the vision of uh, understanding that we're trying to do something that uh, nobody else is really trying to do. And that Bitcoin, in order for it to take over the entire world, has to reach those people, about 2 billion people who are unbanked and everybody else. And the only way we can do that is by coming to them with something that's of an Apple quality in terms of the usability, the language, and the framing of what Bitcoin is. Because if it continues to be framed as only an asset, only a speculative thing that uh, only the rich can be uh, involved in, then it's never going to get anywhere and it's not going to fulfill its promise. Hmm. Um, are you planning to expand to other uh, crypto assets such as stable coins, which uh, like, like Tether, for example, um, which are complementary to Bitcoin? They're usually used as on and off ramps for Bitcoin or, you know, you're specifically sticking with Bitcoin for now. Hi, everyone. Pardon the interruption. I'm Tony Edward, the founder and host of the Thinking Crypto podcast. I have a huge favor to ask you if you haven't subscribed as yet on YouTube or the podcast platforms, hit that subscribe button, hit the thumbs up button, hit the notification bell on the YouTube platform and on Spotify or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts, please leave a five-star rating and review. It supports the podcast. It allows me to bring great quality content to you. Thank you for your support and I'll let you get back to the content. Well, this is a, in, inside of Teco, this is a, a very, well, inside Bitcoin, this is a very controversial subject. And why it's a, a controversial subject is to, is it's it down entirely to what a stable coin is. Mm. Now, uh, being a libertarian, I'm not a, uh, averse to people experimenting with software, experimenting with models, and doing whatever they think they can do to serve the public and make a profit. I'm not against that at all. But uh, Bitcoin is conceived, was conceived as a replacement for the fiat system, which cheats people by design. And so what some people are doing is believing that uh, a stable coin, which has backing by the US dollar, is somehow complementary to, to Bitcoin. Stealing is not complementary to Bitcoin. If you have a token that has at its backing uh, uh, the US dollar, even if those dollars in that uh, tool 
are accounted one for one under a strict audit, the value of the dollar is still being debased by the Federal Reserve. And yeah. so what you're doing is you're bringing these Federal Reserve dollars to uh, millions of people in a pretty package, a nifty looking package on a, in an app, when it's actually still stealing from them. The nature of the dollar doesn't change because you've, you've put it into a different box. Right. The nature of the dollar is the problem. The fiat problem is the problem. And that's what Bitcoin has been given to us to solve. So mixing these two things together is problematic. And also there's an attitude of some people that the third world people are not smart enough to understand Bitcoin. They need dollars because it's something they understand X, Y, Z. Well, I tend not to look down on people like that. Uh, people in the so-called third world are more than capable of understanding Bitcoin, understanding the proposition. And just like everybody else, including people in the West, there is a small learning curve that has to be uh, endured so that people can understand the proposition of Bitcoin. And it's the same for people in the third world as it is for people in the first world. And I think 20 years from now, when we're talking about Bitcoin, uh, maybe not me, but other people talking about Bitcoin, they are going to understand this is actually what happened. It took time for people to understand the fiat problem. Nobody understood it when Bitcoin was released. But now, when you can put away a tenth of a Bitcoin in your wallet, and it's worth exactly the same, if not more, 10 years from now, right. saving all of a sudden becomes something that makes sense. Because now, if you have any understanding of money, the, the devaluation of the dollar through the Federal Reserve printing and everything else makes your savings lose value over time by design. Mm. And so this theft, which is exactly what it is, is intolerable to anybody who understands what's going on, especially if you have a, a huge amount of money. And so you need a tool to save your money in where the supply cannot be debased on demand. And that's what Bitcoin gives to everybody, for sure. poor as well as rich. So, you know, you mentioned the educational aspect, and that's, like you said, true for everybody, whether you're in a first world country or a third world country. Everybody has to go through that learning experience. Um, what initiatives uh, or campaigns do you have going on to help educate folks and to learn about this technology? And, you know, and, and many of them uh, may not understand blockchain initially, like all of us, but, you know, to understand how the blockchain works and the underlying technology and the proof of work concept and all these great uh, principles of Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you, uh, how's the educational aspect uh, come into play? Well, this is, uh, once again, it's a very interesting topic and there certainly is some value in understanding the, the, the fiat problem, hmm. which Safadine has done very, very well with his book, The, the, the Fiat Standards. It's uh, changed the minds of many, many people. But at the same time, if we think about the number of people that have to be brought on board onto Bitcoin, which measures in the billions, it is not sensible, it's not rational to expect all of those people to understand how the tools that they use work. Nobody expects anybody who, the billions of people who use SSL in a browser to understand how SSL works right. or how SMS works or how iOS or Android works. They just need to be given to them something that actually does work. Mm. That's understandable in a way that if I press this button here, my cousin Yinka in Joss will uh, receive the equivalent of $100 and then he can spend that wherever he wants. That's mm. all they need to understand. So this idea of Bitcoin education, whilst it's very, very useful and sometimes even entertaining, it's not going to help us reach a billion people. We've got to go to people with a proposition that doesn't require training. And of course, Apple do this absolutely brilliantly. It's why their MacBook Pros don't get shipped with an instruction book, because you mm -hmm. open it and it teaches you by its operation how to use it. And so what we need is actually consumer grade wallets like Wallet Satoshi, like um, Breeze, like Samurai Wallet, that when you open them up, you get the experience of Bitcoin out of the box. And so I'll give you a good example of, of how to be anti-consumer. There's some wallets that used to do this, but they don't anymore. 
Um, I'm not going to take responsibility for that, although I'd like to. They used to demand that a user would write down their mnemonic and then prove that they'd written it down before they would allow you to receive your first transaction in Bitcoin. Mm. Now, this might uh, appear at, on the surface to be an attempt to uh, take care of the user so that they don't, uh, if their wallet goes down or their phone gets stolen, they can recover their, their Bitcoin. But actually what it does, it, it presents a barrier to the ordinary person. And it also makes them very frightened about this strange thing called Bitcoin, which actually is not so dangerous and doesn't require this kind of stuff. So the sensible people like Wallet of Satoshi have removed that requirement entirely and it just works straight out of the box. As soon as you download it and run it for the first time, you're ready to receive Bitcoin. And so education is important, but it has to be done in the appropriate way. It doesn't make sense to ask ordinary people, D-Y-O-R, do your own research, read a whole bunch of books about it, understand economics, understand this, the, the blockchain and all this business, because first of all, nobody cares. And secondly, to really understand these things, you have to have a, a high degree of training one way or another in software. And so if Bitcoin's to become a consumer uh, service all over the world, you've got to use the same methodology that Apple, Samsung, and all these other companies use to get their complicated uh, tools and services into the hands of people. And that's by removing the complexity and giving people something that just works out of the box. Hmm, for sure. Um, what else is on your roadmap for 2024? Well, uh, in 2024, we have some very, very uh, secret integrations coming up. Um, well, they're very secret and they're very interesting. And they're going to put us into, uh, put us on the global stage. That's all I can say about it. And uh, this is going to transform how not only people get a hold of Bitcoin, but it's going to transform how people think about Bitcoin. I think that those two problems are closely related and they can be solved both at the same time. We have to get the simple proposition and essentially the truth about Bitcoin in front of as many people as possible. So in our roadmap for this year, that's going to be the case. Everybody's going to be very surprised about how Bitcoin actually can work if you take away the complexity and think about it correctly. Many people, when they use Azteco for the first time, whether they've used other services or not, they say, why isn't everything this easy? Well, it's not that easy because the people who designed those services misconstrued Bitcoin. We didn't make that mistake. And so there's going to be a, a flood, a global flood of people who understand Bitcoin and who now think about it the way that we think about it, which we obviously think is the correct way. And so that's the most important thing in our roadmap. Exponential growth and uh I wouldn't say proselytizing, but spreading the message of how simple Bitcoin can be, what it can actually be used for, for the vast majority of people on earth and things like that. And I think it's very exciting. That's awesome. Um, now, you had brought up um, just a couple of questions ago, you know, the debasement of fiat currency. And this is a problem we see globally, right? This is the system we live in, the, the fiat debt based system and they continue to print us into oblivion. Um, do you think though, Bitcoin will be adopted by different countries and central banks where it could help solve this fiat currency problem? Because the debt can keep going for on, on forever. At some point, they're gonna have to do some sort of reset or change this system. But is Bitcoin part of the solution? Well, it, they can choose to um, accept Bitcoin's offer or not. And if they choose not to accept Bitcoin's offer, that means they're going to have to do, a, as you say, a reset and relaunch another fiat with a, a, a smaller amount of what, well, a small amount of uh, coins in circulation or notes in circulation, and then the cycle will start again, and it'll be I don't know another fifty. Actually, the average life of the fiat currencies over the the twentieth century was sixteen years. I don't know if you knew that. But so it'll be another set of 
pushing the problem back into the future. That's what Keynes said. It doesn't matter that we do this because in the end we're all dead. Well, anybody who has children knows that your children are going to inherit the system, whether it's the, the, the euro or the dollar. And so thinking about the future means that you don't want to have the currency to go kaboom with all your savings in it just evaporated. So these countries are going to have to choose between the, uh, the free offer of Bitcoin, which brings with it a whole bunch of disciplines, or, or, uh, or fiat. And there are a couple of countries now that uh, the most famous one being El Salvador, right. which has you know, made Bitcoin legal tender, which is a, a sage move. And now with the Bitcoin price going through the ceiling, as we predict is going to, to happen, uh, they're going to benefit tremendously from using Bitcoin as legal tender. And then there'll be other, many other side effects of that. If they allow businesses to come into El Salvador and to uh, incorporate and do business without interference, mm. then that country could be the global center of all Bitcoin businesses. And since they'll be taxed in El Salvador instead of New York, then El Salvador will reap the benefits of all of that. But just imagine all the world's money as Bitcoin flowing through businesses in El Salvador. They'll be able to pave the roads with gold there if they do this. Now, obviously, there's uh, uh, just like moving away from fiat, there's a price for governments in doing this kind of thing. They're going to have to relinquish the idea that they have to control everything. Mm -hmm. And if they're able to do that, the benefits will come. It's like the Laffer Curve, actually. Uh, if you tax less, it's an optimum amount of regulation, just like there's an optimum amount of uh, taxation, beyond which if you tax more, the returns are increasingly diminished. So mm -hmm. they have to get the regulation right. They can't regulate everything. And if they get that right, everybody will flood to El, El Salvador or wherever it is and incorporate there and they'll reap the benefits. Compare and contrast with New York, with its bit license, with the most yeah. un-American, anti, it's just absolutely just unconstitutionalist, appalling. And of course, nobody wants to incorporate in New York. They're all fleeing from New York. And what benefits are going to have to the United States and to New York? It's going to be very negative. And so that's the complete situation. These countries will move to Bitcoin, but they have to understand that it means giving up something. It means giving up absolute control. It means giving up the control over the supply of money, which they've been using to do all kinds of vanity projects, distribute money, money amongst themselves and their friends. And that has to go away. They're going to have to find some other way to have a grift, but that's another story. But if they do that, everybody's going to benefit. And in fact, they might just have to do it by default, because if everybody on earth with a cellular telephone can receive Bitcoin, that means it will become the de facto money of the entire world and people will stop using the fiats because it's obviously bad for them since the value is going down and then we'll have a new kind of money all over the world which nobody actually put in place through law but economics and the market put it in place and once that happens just like the end-to-end -end encryption of whatsapp and things like that uh, once that happens it's irrevocable it cannot be removed and you'll find, just like with WhatsApp, these governments and their employees like WhatsApp because they know it's private. And they're just the same as everybody else. They want privacy. They want sound money. Uh, it's a question with them of whether they can make that money quickly or over, over time. And so that giving them that choice, I think, is probably not a good idea, which is why Bitcoin should spread just like WhatsApp and all the other things and BitTorrent without anybody's permission, without asking anybody, should we or should we not do that? It should just happen. And then Bitcoin's everywhere, and then it's just a force of nature. Right. And what we are seeing, though, is that these governments are using the underlying technology of uh, Bitcoin's underlying technology of blockchain and trying to build what's called central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, and tokenizing fiat currencies. Now, I'm concerned about that. I, I understand what they're trying to do, but... A lot of people are worried about privacy and and control, you know, how they will control people's money. And it'll probably, I don't know if it's going to make the fiat currency problem even worse, right? What are your thoughts on that? 
Absolutely, it will. And first of all, there's a, the, the problem here is that the using the term blockchain technology, these CDBCs are not really um, anything to do with Bitcoin at all. Technically, they're just essentially databases. Mm -hmm. And these databases will be under total control of the Federal Reserve or whoever it is. And by the way, Ted Cruz and some others have uh, sponsored a bill uh, banning these things from the United States, which is a very good thing. So what these what they're doing is they're trying to bring in a system where they have absolute control over everyone's money. Every single wallet that you use under these CDBC systems will be known um, by the by the state. They'll be able to cut off your money and your ability to use it whenever they like. And even worse, they'll be able to stop you from buying, say, a can of Bud Light when you want to, because you'll have only a certain amount of money a month that's allowable to be spent on things that you like, like Bud. So, uh, and along with this, will have to come some kind of national ID register so that when you go and spend this money, they know who it is who's spending the money on two sides. So it, this is a super, super anti-American idea. It's a very bad idea. It's turning fiat into not just a, a way to steal money from the American people, but to steal their freedom as well as their money. And the way to beat these CDBCs, first of all, is for people like Ted Cruz and Hawley and all these people to bring in legislation forbidding the Federal Reserve from launching such a monstrosity, and also the people who are sovereigns in America, switching to a, 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 a form of money, a form of synthetic money that cannot be controlled by any state, not just the, the American state, and that's Bitcoin. And so anybody who's really against this CDBC abomination from uh, coming to pass is spreading Bitcoin like their lives depended on it. And actually it does. So that's actually the answer, not worrying about CDBCs, but spreading Bitcoin through tools and services that anybody can use instantaneously. Once, let's just think about it this way. If every single person in the United States had a copy of Wallet of Satoshi, that's 340 million people. If they all had Wallet of Satoshi and they were all using Bitcoin, it would be much harder to roll out a CDBC with all the other opposing forces also. It'd be much harder because everybody's on, uh, on Bitcoin, just mm -hmm. like everybody's on WhatsApp. You can't ban WhatsApp, you can't ban Signal now because so many people are using it. That's the way to kill the CDBCs. And of course, that Carstairs character says explicitly that they want to have the fine grain control over every dollar that's spent. No American should be for that and think that he should be called an American. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. Yeah, for sure. Um, now, we got Bitcoin getting adopted um, by financial institutions with the launch of the Bitcoin spot ETF. Love to get your thoughts on that and how, what impact you think that's going to have on the adoption of Bitcoin. I think well, the, the, it's interesting. If we think of Bitcoin in the same way that we think about email and the, and the web, the web was adopted first by you know, the, your geeks and software developers and people like that, and then it grew that way. And then it was only much later that the big corporates got onto the internet and had their own websites and their own web services and even email. And so this ETF is uh, very good symbolically because what it does, it, it shows that these institutions that previously were, well, this class of institution, which were previously very skeptical about Bitcoin, are now warm, have now warmed up to it totally. They're hot for it now. That's how much they've warmed up for it. Yeah. And they're, they're making a fortune on Bitcoin. And they've proved also that it is, it is legitimate. Nobody says now that Bitcoin isn't legitimate. It's only for these bad use, use cases. And that I think that's the most important effect that these ETFs are imposing on the West. Mm. These ETFs are only for a small number of uh, accredited investors. It's not for everybody. And so this is more symbolic than it is practical. And... Uh, in so far as it's driving up the, the price of Bitcoin, that's also good because what it's going to do is attract more people uh, into Bitcoin at the lower levels who are running their own wallets, buying Azteco vouchers to fill them up and that kind of thing. So 
it, all in all, I think it's a good thing. I think it's a very positive thing. And it, it, I, it may lead eventually to the United States government actually recognizing Bitcoin in some uh, legal form, just like El Salvador does, with probably really a light version of that. And that will uh, further erase people's doubts about it, make it easier for Bitcoin startups to raise money when it comes to any service that handles it. And means it me it'll mean that nobody's laughing at Bitcoin anymore. For many years, people will laugh at it and mock it. And even though it's been sound all the way through from the beginning, Bitcoin hasn't changed. It's the people who have changed. And I think this ETF is a key moment in people changing their minds about Bitcoin. It's now okay to like Bitcoin. It's now okay to put your money in Bitcoin because the ETFs are here. And so it, the, the the landscape has changed, and I think it's a very good thing. Yeah, you, know, you brought up a great point that I didn't think about, um, and that is these big institutions, which are well known, they're, they're, people are familiar with the brands and so forth, your Fidelities, your Black Rocks, they uh, building these ET, uh, Bitcoin products. Um, it's hard for the government to go fight against them because, look, let's be honest, the political system, the BlackRock and Fidelity make campaign donations to politicians and influence the lawmakers. So to your point, the U.S. federal government could, could pivot and embrace it and, and change laws uh, because the biggest institutions in the world, especially in the United States, are adopting it. That's exactly right. And also the on an individual level, the senators and congressmen are all investing in Bitcoin uh, more or less in secret, although it's not secret. They are, they are now, and I've always said this, that the journalists and the politicians must become peers in the network in some capacity. When it's not in their interest for the Bitcoin price to go down, when they're invested in it, when they're going to lose personally, if anybody disparages Bitcoin, they're going to make sure that if somebody is found disparaging Bitcoin in any journal, counter articles will be released saying this is nonsense, Bitcoin is absolutely sound because they're going to benefit from it personally. No government official is going to put uh, restrictions on Bitcoin that will hamper its growth because if Bitcoin grows into the, into the market and is accepted by everybody, the value of their investment is going to go up. So mm -hmm. they're incentivized to uh, do their jobs properly and not get involved with the uh, commerce of ordinary American people. So that's another reason why these ETFs are a very good thing. It gives exposure to Bitcoin to people who would not normally get exposure. And mm -hmm. you're not going to get congressmen and senators downloading a wallet and then you know getting onto Coinbase and stuff. They're too busy to do that kind of stuff. But their account managers can get uh, exposure to Bitcoin through these ETFs and then all of a sudden they're incentivized. They're incentivized in theory and in fact, and they're going to do everything they can to make those investments go up. And in the case of Bitcoin, that means backing off, let the market grow exponentially and naturally, just as the internet grew exponentially and naturally, and then they'll benefit. That has to happen. Yeah, absolutely. I want to get your thoughts. Uh, I know we're running up on time, but uh, the Bitcoin Lightning Network, um, there are many different apps and folks working on the Lightning Network to improve the uh, transactability, so to speak, of Bitcoin to make things faster and so forth. What are your thoughts on, on the Lightning Network and the developments happening there? Well, Steco started as an on-chain only company selling our vouchers that were redeemable on-chain. And we knew that as everybody else knows who's working in Bitcoin, that the fees have to go up if the Bitcoin network grows and uh, adoption continues. And we've seen that recently with the uh, Bitcoin fees for one transaction going up to like $25. And so it's not feasible for somebody who needs $10 of Bitcoin to pay a $25 transaction fee. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of Lightning is a godsend. It's an absolutely wonderful thing. It not only removes the impediment and the, the, the problem of the Bitcoin fees, but it's also super fast. It's mm -hmm. super fast. You can send very, very, very small amounts of Bitcoin, just as you could in the original super early days of Bitcoin when the fees were uh, fantastically low. The Lightning Network has essentially given Bitcoin back to itself. It's the promise of Bitcoin fulfilled through this uh, this new layer, layer one, that was it layer two, it's layer two, 
and it's been an absolutely wonderful invention. I think it's absolutely fantastic. And Lightning Labs is one of the most important companies ever to start in Bitcoin. And we are very grateful to them for doing this super innovative, super difficult, actually dangerous work. And they've pulled it off. They've pulled it off. I think it's fair to say that the Lightning Labs saved Bitcoin. Uh, mm -hmm. They certainly saved the use case of small amounts of Bitcoin going to and fro all over the world. And uh, in our concept, in our conception, in our framing of Bitcoin, that's an absolute prerequisite to world domination. And so, you know, thanks a lot, Elizabeth Stark and Olo Alua Olsen Yeah, for sure. Um, now, I've got some rapid questions here for you. First, uh, because the metaverse is being created, if you could create your own metaverse, what would the theme be? The theme for our own metaverse. Mm. Uh, well, uh, yeah, if, we, if, if I could start my own metaverse, the theme and all the rules would come from one book, which is Murray Rothbard's For a New Liberty. Mm. And all the rules in that metaverse would be based on uh, the libertarian principles of non-aggression. And I think that would be a very, very interesting place to, uh, to exist. Although in a, in a digital place, you can't really aggress against people uh, in real life. But just as an idea, as a way of training people to understand uh, libertarianism, I think that would be very, very cool. Mm. And I got some rapid fire questions here for you. Favorite food? Uh, my favorite food, any kind of haute cuisine. Uh, favorite musician or band? Uh, I'm partial to um, musicians. Well, I'm partial to the group Wire. I think they're, they're obviously a wonderful group. And uh, I also like uh, any any recording by Gustav Leonhardt of Bach's work, mm -hmm. which is uh, always superb. Favorite movie? Uh at a guess, out of the box, 2001 A Space Odyssey. It's quite a good one. For sure. One I keep going back to. Yeah, one of my favorites. Uh, favorite book? Favorite book? Well, I'll be the King James Bible. Mm. And when you're not working at Azteca, what are you doing for fun? Uh, I fly mid radio control models, uh, gliders, actually, the discus gliders, discus launch gliders. And... Uh, what else ride a bicycle around to try and keep fit because most of the time i've sat down in the office either writing software or barking over this uh this this camera and so i try and get out and uh, do some cycling so i stay fit that's awesome yeah that's great man uh again pleasure chatting with you and i'm excited to see future updates around azteco and uh i absolutely believe in the mission that you're doing and support you as much as you can. And folks, uh, I'll have links to the website and so forth. So you can go check out uh, Azteco's website. Um, but again, like I said, pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Tony.